So I, I suspect that um, many of you, while uh, you're sitting there, uh, are breathing. <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> yeah, some, some may be forgetting you. Sometimes we forget, kind of. But and we know that the Buddha taught us to be mindful of our breathing. Yeah to watch our breathing in meditation. Is there a doctor in the house? that they're okay. Anyway, they've got quite a few doctors. So. Okay, so the Buddha taught us to be mindful of our breath, but if we look in the instructions in the Anapanasati Sutta, one of the, the, the discourse on mindfulness of breathing, one of the things which uh, we perhaps don't pay so much attention to is this, the Buddha said one should contemplate uh, internally, one should contemplate externally, and one should contemplate, and in the Pali it uses the phrase internally, externally, inside, outside. So normally when we pay attention to the breath, yeah, we feel the breath that's inside us, don't we? Yeah? It's part of who we are. But actually we pay attention to the breath most of the time at the tip of our nose. And it's actually on the boundary between who we are and who we are not, between what's inside us and what's outside us. And if we think about breath meditation like that, then we realize that there's actually only one breath. We think that every time we breathe in, there's a kind of a new breath, and you breathe out, there's a new breath. But actually there's only one breath, isn't there? There's just one body of air. yeah. And sometimes part of it moves into us, but only a tiny part. And it's actually the same body of air that's around us all the time. We call it the atmosphere. But the atmosphere is just our breath. There's nothing different. There's only one breath. So we're all sitting in here breathing each other's breath. I don't know if that's a bit icky, but... <laughs> it's true, isn't it? Yeah? And each time we breathe in, part of what we're breathing in becomes, literally, physically, becomes who we are, doesn't it? Because we know the oxygen is drawn out of the breath, it enters our bloodstream fuels our muscles and goes to build the proteins and all of these kinds of things. Keeps us alive. And that's, that's just one breath. So this is why in the, in the Pali it has this beautiful phrasing, internally, externally, and then internally, externally. It's like one compound word. What it means is that, well, you realize that there's no real difference between what's inside here and what's outside there. Actually, they're just the same. This is just a part of this one breath. So from uh, I've been contemplating in the last couple of weeks about quite a lot about what 
we in English what we call the environment. And of course the, the idea of an environment is really quite alien to Buddhism, Buddhist way of thinking, because in Buddhist way of thinking there's really just Dhamma, there's really just nature. Environment suggests that there's something here which is separate, like there's humanity which is one thing and then there's things that are around us which are something else. Which is not the case at all, is it? It's not the case in certainly not the case in, in Buddhism and it's it's not the case in, in the reality of it either, is it? That where there's no separate humanity which is different from the environment. We're a part of it, we're a part of nature. We participate in it, we participate with it. And we don't do that in a in an abstract sense or a philosophical sense, we do that in an actual, real way. Every time we breathe in and every time we breathe out, we quite literally become nature and we are contributing to it. In the last week I read in the, in the newspaper they said that the, the uh, levels of CO2 in the atmosphere is now up to 394 parts per million, record levels. After all this talk about climate change and trying to do something about it and so on. And still we're at record levels and there's no sign of slowing down. And that's not just something out there. It's not just a detail in the newspaper. That's the air that you are breathing every moment. It's part of who you are. It's part of who I am. So I think it's very important to reflect from time to time on the, uh, the this very important question, this one of the most urgent issues of our time, as our former Prime Minister famously said, that, that climate change was the great moral issue of our time, before he famously decided to do nothing about it. <laughs> And I agree with that first bit of what he did, but not quite the second bit. Yeah. It is. It's the great, greatest moral challenge that we're facing. And so this is not... We shouldn't see this as being separate from our Buddhist practice. We should, we should reflect and try to understand how this relates to uh, the Dhamma, how it relates to Buddhism, how it relates to our practice. <clears throat> you know, for myself, uh, I, I uh, encountered uh, Buddhism... Uh, when I was uh, about 26 and I went to Thailand and uh, practiced in a meditation center and so on. And one of the things that I learned you know, very quickly there was, that, uh, was how to live much more simply. And after I became a monk, I went to stay, I spent most of my time in Thailand as a monk at a monastery called Pujom Gom. I spent three rains retreats there. And... Uh, the Pujam Kom is a very, very simple place and we literally would just have a little little hut with grass uh, or bamboo walls. Well, the first train retreat I spent there was just on a platform in a cave. And then after that I sort of upgraded to the luxury of having bamboo walls and a grass roof and a wooden floor. And so that's all we have. And we'd have just the robes that we're wearing, three robes, one meal a day. cup of coffee in the, in the evening, of course. There's some things we have to, can't do without. And that was the happiest I've ever been in my life. And I realised that the more that I gave up and the less things that I had, the happier that I was. And what was, I think, quite striking for me as someone who, who you know, come from a fairly wealthy country like Australia, you know, I could go to Thailand and see... Uh, the villagers and how the villagers were living and from my perspective they were very poor you know they really didn't have much but they actually had when I was there as a monk they actually had a lot more than I did they had cars and TVs and you know three meals a day and these kinds of things so I actually had less a lot less than those very poor people did and I, that was the happiest I've ever been and I could, I could sit there 
and sometimes I would just sit there and I'd just look around my little hut and it's just a, a very small little hut like that and it's so small and yet it's still mostly empty. Even though it's so small, there's actually hardly anything in it, just my three robes, a cup, a bottle of water, a straw mat to sleep on, that's about it. And I'd look around there and I'd think, what else could I possibly want? And I really couldn't think of anything. I'd really try hard and think, what actually do I want? And I couldn't think of anything that I actually wanted. And that's still the case today. People, these days I go around to different places and people offer me things. And they say, you know, Bhante, please, is there anything that you'd like? Anything I can get you? I think, is there anything I want? Um, I, 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 I honestly cannot think of anything that I actually want. Apart from, you know, enlightenment and stuff. <laughs> the things that people can buy in a shop. I, uh, when I go, sometimes I go into shopping centres, you know, I have some business or something I need to do, and you kind of wander down there and you think, my goodness, it's amazing, this world of reflections and lights shining at you and madness everywhere. And I look, I think, is there anything here that I actually want? No, nothing. And so I think this, to me, this is always points in a very meaningful way to the, the actual problem which is lying behind uh, all the problems we have with the environment and so on. It's actually, you know, we, we tend to approach it, it tends to be discussed on a, like an economic level. Do we have a, a, a tax of 10% or 12% on carbon or do we, you know, is it a matter of a political thing? Do you limit the amount of emissions or something like that? So it tends to be discussed on these kind of levels or else on a scientific level of understanding the, the greenhouse effect and so on. And all of those, of course, all of those things are important and they all play their part. But underlying that, fueling the whole thing, I believe, is a spiritual problem. And it's a spiritual problem of a lack of a sense of meaning, a lack of a sense of contentment, and, uh, and, 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 and too much of that sense of separation yeah, of, of, of just forgetting that my actions here have consequences, that, they, that they're not, are not cut off from other people and what other people are doing. And too often this is what we've, we've, we've created our society to do, haven't we? We've created our society so that we can kind of disappear a lot of the negative consequences of our actions, you know, the, the poverty, the e exploitation of resources, the extinction of species, the pollution, exploitation of workers, all of these kinds of things are sort of outside of our awareness. And when a little bit of it comes into our awareness, for example, this happened in the last week with the, the uh, live animal exports, and this has been going on for decades, but when it, a little bit of it breaks through into awareness, people are so shocked to realise actually this is, this is what we're doing. And there's so much cruelty and suffering involved. But these things are going on all the time. It's part of who we are. So there's a beautiful uh, story in one of the Buddhist suttas uh, called the uh, Aganya Sutta. Uh, sometimes translated as the knowledge of beginnings. And uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that one, but if, if you're not, you should uh, go out and uh, have a look at it. Aganya Sutta in the Diganikaya, essentially it's a kind of, it's a Buddhist uh, parable of Genesis, a right? story of how the world began and evolved and so on. Now, I've, many of you probably may know that that the uh, origin stories, origin myths, are found in every culture. Every people has a story of where they came from and how the structures of society and so on came about. There's hundreds of origin myths all around the world. And the only one, the Buddhist origin myth, is the only one, as far as I know, that begins by saying, there comes a time when the world ends. 
I love that. Uh, the Buddha, you just can't beat him. Yeah? He's telling a story, a Genesis story. There comes a time when the world ends. Because, of course, according to Buddhism, there's no such thing as an absolute beginning. Yeah? You can't, the idea of an absolute beginning to things is, is a nonsense as far as Buddhism is concerned. What we, all we can ever see, all we can ever know is the cycles, the changes. So there comes a time when the world ends. And then after a while, then the world begins again. It evolves, literally. In Pali, it uses this word, vivata, is to evolve. So when the world evolves again, the earth appears. And uh, the earth at that time is like a, a, a sea or a swamp. There's no features to it. It's un, undifferentiated. And above that earth, there are beings which are said to be beings of light, which move through the air, feeding on joy. And below them is just the, the, the trackless expanse of the wastes. <clears throat> and eventually, on the surface, on the skin of the, 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 the waters, there appears this thing, in the text it calls it rasapatui, which kind of translated as the nectar of earth, or something like that. It's a bit obscure, but it's said to be uh, uh, to taste very sweet, like like wild honey, and to have the texture of ghee. And it forms on the surface of the water, like the skin that forms on milk when it cools, on hot milk when it cools. And one of the beings wow. sees this and then decides to have a taste. <laughs> Has a taste. And as soon as it has a taste, then greed arises. Yeah, greed arises. It's remarkably similar in many ways to the Genesis story, isn't it? Yeah, where they're kind of reaching for the apple, and then that's the beginning of the end. But anyway, I don't want to necessarily discuss all the, the parallels and so on here. But so greed, and when that when the being does that, then its body becomes more coarse. Yeah? So the, these beings were before were purely spiritual beings living in the air and, and feeding on light, and now they gradually become more coarse. They develop more coarse physical bodies. And as they do so, the earth forms. Right? So parts of the land draw together, and the solid earth appears, and the waters appear. And so after a while, they, they eat this ratapatawi, and they eat it all until it disappears. And then after that, another species appears. It's like a kind of mushroom. They eat all that until it disappears. And they eat so another kind of plant appears, like a kind of vine. And they eat that until that disappears. And each time as they eat it, their bodies become more solid and more coarse. And the earth keeps evolving every time that they do this. Then different the seasons appear, the different lands appear, the distinctions on the land masses, the different kinds of animals and plants all appear uh, throughout all of this process. And so what's important about this process, so you can see, is that there's an interdependence between human action and the evolution of the environment. Yeah? What the choices that the, that the, that the beings are making is creating the environment that they're living in. There's a co-creation. So this is, this is this Buddhist idea of, of interdependence and co-creation of things. We are part of and participating in the environment right from the beginning. And this, is some, this story, I, f I find this story always amazes me because you know, if you looked at it maybe 30 years ago or 50 years ago, you might think, well, this is a sort of quaint little folk legend, but really it's a bit silly because we all know that, you know, humans don't actually, you know, human actions don't actually change the climate. We all know that. Human greed isn't going to change the climate of the planet. But now, of course, we know different, don't we? We know that that's precisely what happens. And it's precisely human actions and human greed which is what's changing the climate. So for me, this story is, very, uh, is a very profound reflection on the Buddhist attitude towards the environment and the Buddhist attitude towards uh, the choices that we make. The story goes on and develops in quite a lot more detail, which I can't go into now. Uh, but essentially what it points to is that um, 
uh, in 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 living here on the planet and living in this environment, that that it's our responsibility to take care and not to over exploit and overuse the resources that we're surrounded with. And of course, this is the same lesson that we've learnt from history, isn't it? If we look at different peoples, different civilizations throughout history, you see basically that there's two outcomes to any civilization. One outcome is that civilization does not live in balance with its resources. In that case, it will overexploit the resources and the civilization will collapse and everything will come to an end. And that's happened dozens and dozens of times. Or uh, a civilization will learn to live in harmony with the land, learn to live, to use the resources of the land in a balanced way and sustainable way, uh, like, for example, the indigenous peoples of Australia. And in that case, the society can sustain. They're the only two choices that we have. And I think most of you will probably agree with me to say that our current consumer society, if we have to ask which of those two models <laughs> our consumer society is following, well, it looks rather like we're following the first one, doesn't it? That we're, for, we're using our resources willy-nilly without any thought for the future. And this kind of goes on. And we pay... Uh, lip service to ideals like reducing energy usage and so on and so forth. Meanwhile, Australia has the largest floor space. Our houses have a bigger floor space than any other country in the world. Congratulations, Australia. We're one of the highest per capita emitters of CO2 in the world. Congratulations, Australia. One of the highest energy use in the world. The largest coal exporter in the world. Oh, and by the way, we're in the process of investing billions of dollars to uh, basically double our coal exports by 2030. So there are many things about being Australian that I'm very proud of. <laughs> but our record as far as looking after the environment and our record as far as climate change goes is something I'm not proud of. I think we can do a lot better. And I think that I, I would really love to be able to think that I can live in, in an Australia, in a country which has seen the possibilities and which has responded in a positive way to the challenges which we're being faced to, to what Kevin Rudd called the great moral challenge of our time, and which actually used our expertise, our technology, our resources to develop something very positive and very beautiful in the future. This is what I would love to see, but unfortunately, I don't know whether it's going to happen. So one of the reasons that I've been uh, thinking about these issues and uh, contemplating them and discussing them last, last week, I went with a group of other religious uh, leaders to Canberra. And some of you may have seen it, gotten some of the media and so on. And we went and talked to a bunch of uh, ministers, a prime minister and a bunch of other ministers about climate change. And this was really the message that we wanted to deliver. And it's something which was um, common among all the faith traditions. We had Catholics there, uh, Jains, uh, uh, Anglicans, Sikhs, Hindus and so on, many different religious traditions. And everybody was very, very unified in that sense that we feel in some way a spiritual connection with what is around us, with the nature, and that we, have a, we, we shared a very deep feeling of our responsibility to act in a positive way. We heard very moving stories from uh, a lady from uh, Papua New Guinea who has friends and knows people who are living on some of the islands, which are already uh, coming under threat, and people have already had to move their homes uh, because of the effects of climate change. Their lives have already been damaged and destroyed. And she said that many of these people, they just don't understand. They don't know what you know, carbon emissions are. They don't understand what the greenhouse effect is. They're very simple people. And they just, they, they wonder, why is it that the spirits are angry with us? 
What have we done to make these spirits so angry? And of course, the, one of the great tragedies of this is that it's the people who have done nothing who are suffering. And those people are the people who basically don't have any carbon emissions. Probably the biggest carbon emission that they have is when they breathe out. Or maybe when they fart, I don't know. That's probably the biggest one. They've got nothing. They're not contributing to the problem, and yet they're the ones that are going to suffer. And this is the story that we're going to be seeing all around the world in the next 10, 20, 30 years, that those people uh, like ourselves who are emitting the CO2 and who are responsible for the problem are going to be relatively cushioned from the results, and those people who haven't done anything to cause it are going to be the ones who really suffer. So we try to sort of um, bring this uh, consciousness and try to raise awareness and say that this is not something which should be kicked around like a political football. It's not something to be used for point scoring. It's not something uh, where you can just reduce it to some kind of economic fix. It's something which really needs to uh, reshape our perspective. And when we went there, we heard unanimously we went to Canberra unanimously. Every politician we spoke to, from the Prime Minister to all the other ministers, they all accepted the reality of climate change and they all accepted the urgency that something needs to be done about it. And yet, it still seems so hard to do something. We had one talk in the evening. Uh, one of the, the an Anglican bishop gave a talk, Bishop George Browning, and it gave an excellent presentation. And a few people responded. One of the respondents was a, a, a climate scientist from ANU, um, and Jeanette Lindsay, Dr. Jeanette Lindsay. And after her uh, speech, which she gave an excellent speech, I asked her. Um, uh, I said that there has been some studies done. There has been a study done in Melbourne by a group called Beyond Zero who say that Australia can move to 100% renewable energy within 10 years. And I asked her, is, what do you think of this? Is this possible? As somebody who works and specialises in the field. And she said, of course it is. She, she had absolutely no doubt whatsoever that, that te technically there's no obstacle to moving to a situation of zero emissions by 2020. So what matters is how much, how, how, how important do we think that is? How important do we think it is to be able to continue to breathe? How important do we think is it going to be to be able to continue to drink water? What voices are we going to listen to? I'll tell you another story. This is a, uh, uh, <clears throat> one of the uh, Jataka stories from the stories of the Buddha's past lives. This is called the Samuddha Vanija Jataka. And that particular story, it's like a kind of, it's a, like a Robinson Crusoe story or kind of shipwreck story. There's a group of uh, carpenters who were, were, had to leave the city where they were living and they boarded a boat and they were heading, uh, emigrating to another place to find work. And while they were doing so, their boat was uh, blown off course by a storm and uh, they arrived on more or less on Gilligan's Island and <laughs> set themselves up with a, uh, 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 you know, had to try and set themselves up with a new life. They went round exploring the island and they saw there was a wild man living on the island who was just kind of long, matted hair and filthy, dirty, hadn't washed and so on. And it's completely wild. And they, when he saw them, he ran. Eventually they chased him and eventually they managed to talk to him. And uh, when he saw that they didn't wish them, him any harm, he was quite uh, amenable. And he said that he'd been shipwrecked on this island many years beforehand, and he'd made a good life for himself there, that there was plenty of fruit, there were yams, there was plenty to eat. And he said, he welcomed the other people. He said, please come on here. It's, you'll find it's a much nicer lifestyle than you find on the mainland. He said, just, just one thing you know, have to be careful of is that you know, don't, don't mess things up. Don't destroy things. Yeah? There are devas, there are guardian devas here on this island and they're looking after the place and they'll be very happy 
for you to be here and to share this beautiful place. But if you don't take care of it, they're going to be very angry. And you don't want to make the gods angry. So they said, OK, sure, thank you for the warning. So they went off, they built themselves some huts, got everything ready, collected the fruit and made themselves quite a nice life there. And after some days, when they were settled down and they were happy, then they thought, well, what do we do now? We're settled down, we're happy. Someone said, well, let's celebrate. Let's have a party. <laughs> so then they go, oh, OK, we have these coconut trees here. We can tap the coconut trees and, and make some toddy. Yeah. So if you lived in Asian countries, you know toddy is the easiest kind of liquor that you can brew. You just tap the, uh, the coconut tree, get the liquid, and then the next day it will ferment and you've got a nice strong brew. So they made the toddy, got very drunk, and when they got drunk they were very heedless and just peed everywhere. Yeah? So instead of looking after the place, they just pissed on it. <laughs> and the few that didn't get drunk were warning them, saying, no, 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 be careful, you know, just, just control yourselves. And then that, but they just wouldn't. They just pissed everywhere and made a big mess until everything stank. And the gods got very, very angry. And the gods had this council, and they were talking among themselves. They're saying, how can these people do this? We welcomed them to our home. We provided them with fresh water. We gave them food to, to eat. We gave them everything they could want to have a happy life here. And all we asked was that they show a little bit of moderation and restraint. So they said, well, they, they, they decided... The Davis themselves were a bit undecided about what they were going to do, but then they <clears throat> finally they came to an agreement. They were going to send a tsunami. They were going to wipe those people off the face of the, of the island. They were going to drown them all. And so among the Davis, one of them was a, a good Deva, so he went to tell the people and said, I'm here to warn you. Build a boat build an ark. Actually, this is a version of the Noah's Ark story, which is in the Buddhist uh, scriptures, in the Buddhist Jataka stories. Build an ark. Save yourselves. There's going to be a flood. None of you are going to survive. Set to work hard now, and you can build the boat, and then you'll be able to be saved. Otherwise, you're all going to drown. And then one of the other Davis, who was not so well-intentioned, came along, and he said, Oh, don't listen to that other guy. He's just a real killjoy. We're not going to do anything bad to you. Look, see, the sun is shining. The fish are swimming in the sea. The mangoes are on the mango trees. Just enjoy yourself. Here, have some more toddy. <laughs> She'll be right. Business as usual. Yeah. So this, they were hearing these two voices telling them these two messages. And I don't know about you. But when I read this story and I heard these two messages, I thought, those messages sound very familiar. I seem to hear those messages quite often. <laughs> In the newspapers, it's two different, quite different messages. So anyway, one group of the islanders decided they're going to heed the message and they built an ark. There they are in the hot sun, collecting wood, nailing it together. And all the other ones are just laughing at them. You know, they're just having a good time, playing music, drinking more toddy. Until finally it came. Yeah? The flood came, the tsunami came, swept across the island. Yeah? And those who had uh, heeded the warning, they were saved. The other ones, they were drowned. So this is the uh, Samudhavani Jadatika, the Buddhist flood story. So again, I find I find this. I've been I've been uh, using this story a lot recently because I think it's important to show that that this kind of conception, this understanding of of uh, nature, of the environment, of our responsibility for caring for it, this is not just a new thing. It's not something which we've invented, yeah, in our generation. It's actually something which is absolutely intrinsic to the Buddhist way of seeing things right from the beginning. And actually, you know, if you think about it, most of the things which uh, we're asking 
we were asked to do, you know, in terms of looking after the environment and trying to save the environment and help the environment, most of them are just things which, until a generation ago, everybody did anyway. Yeah? Be frugal. Recycle things, yeah? Don't, you know, you don't need like a... a everyone in the house doesn't have to have a car. <laughs> you don't have to have big huge TV sets in every room. It's just a kind of ordinary frugality, ordinary common sense that our planet has been extremely kind to us. It's given us all of these things. And all that the planet asks from us is just a little bit of care, a little bit of moderation, a little bit of restraint. It doesn't have to be anything exceptional. So there was one other um, Jataka story that I read, which I also felt had a very powerful uh, message as far as the environment goes. This one is called the Pandana Jataka. And uh, this story is about a cartwright. And this cartwright wanted to build a wheel for a cart for a chariot. And he didn't know how to build the perfect wheel. And so somehow this cartwright, this wheelwright, came across this black lion. He met this black lion. Now, for some reason, which I'm entirely unsure of, he, just, he thought that a black lion would be an expert in how to make wheels. So he asked the black, we just have to sort of bleep over that bit of the story. I'm not quite sure <laughs> why that was. Anyway, he asks the lion, why, how do you build a perfect wheel for a cart? Lions in the Jataka stories can talk, as can other animals. So. Now, as it happened, they asked this lion, and this lion used to uh, have his daytime siesta under this huge tree in the forest. Yeah? But the tree had uh, dropped some branches on him while he was sleeping there. Yeah? So this lion is sleeping there, his branches fall on him, disturbed him in his sleep. So this lion had this, conceived this hatred for the deva who lived in the tree. So when the wheelwright asked him, what kind of wood is the best wood for making a wheel? The lion said, ah, oh, that tree over there, yeah, that's the perfect wood for making a wheel. So the wheelwright said, oh, okay. So he goes over with his axe, is about to chop the tree down. Now the deva in the tree was, understandably enough, was pretty annoyed with the lion by this point. So he stopped the man from chopping the tree down and he says, you're going to chop the tree down, you want to use my wood for making a wheel, wheel. I can't stop you, he said, but you need more than that to make the perfect wheel. And the wheelwright says, oh really, what is it, what else do I need? Well, you need something to bind the wheel together with. Oh yeah, I will, what's, what's the best thing? Well, you can't beat the skin of a black lion. <laughs> So the wheelwright killed the lion, chopped down the tree, and made a very beautiful wheel. So you can see what that story means for, as far as the environment goes. The wheel, of course, is technology, isn't it? Yeah? The wheel is technology, the wheel of progress. Yeah? And the lion and the deva and the tree, these are like the protectors the protectors of nature, yeah? These, this is like the voice of conscience. They should be standing together. They should be speaking with each other, yeah? But they weren't. They were divided. And because they were divided, this was how uh, that had happened. Actually, they could have said, well, to the wheelwright, you can use that fallen log over there to make your wheel, yeah? And the wheelwright would have made a perfectly good wheel out of a fallen timber. But because they were divided and betraying each other, because they weren't speaking with one voice, and this is how the wheelwright managed to have his success. So again, I think this is something also which is very, very important to, to remember, that as people here in Australia, we're not powerless. We often we think we're powerless, but actually we're not. We have a voice. As, as a Buddhist community, we have a voice, and we can speak. And we should not just speak 
for, for our, out of our own self-interest. But we should speak from a sense of the, the interest and the good of others, of the environment, of nature, of the planet as a whole. We should find within Dhamma, within Buddhism, we should find the means for a growing and an expansion of our moral consciousness. We should become more sensitive to the pain and the suffering that's experienced around us. We should be more sensitive to the injustices that's caused because of uh, climate change and other kinds of uh, exploitation. We should become more attuned to the shifts and the, the um, imbalances that are happening within nature, that are occurring all around the world right now. And we should be more concerned for the future, more concerned for uh, our children, our grandchildren, and for yourself as well, because you're going to get reborn here. <laughs> I was talking about this with my, my stepfather. And, uh, and he's like, oh, well, our old people have done our time. It's up for you young people to fix the problems now. And I was like, oh, thank you very much. You just come here and mess everything up, and <laughs> we'll fix it. And I said, but don't worry. According to Buddhism, you're going to come back again, and uh, you're going <laughs> to have to experience it. So this is... Uh, uh, we will experience it. We will experience those results. And this is one of the most basic things in Buddhism, that actions have consequences. This is karma, basic law of karma. Actions have consequences. And we can't just go and chop down all the forests and take out all the fish from the seas and just have whatever we want whenever we want it, burn up all the oil and the coal. We can't just do those things and expect there to be no consequences. Of course there will be consequences. And of course those, those consequences will be very serious. So this is something I'd like you to take home with you this evening. It's just to reflect on this, to come back to that idea I mentioned at the beginning of the talk of that one breath, that the breath we are breathing is the same breath that's coming out of your exhaust pipe of your car when you're driving home tonight. That same breath which is coming off the, the ocean from the Antarctica where the ice is melting. It's that same breath that all the people around us are breathing in and breathing out. It's just that one breath and this is connecting us always with the rest of the planet. So I offer these few reflections for you this evening on Buddhism and the environment.